What another exciting episode that we are blessed, okay, more than fortunate to be a part of when God is showing all these hidden truths that are in the Bible, okay? Someone brought up Achior yesterday, okay? And we're about to go over that before we continue where we was at. All right, Achior was an Ammonite. All right, so we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 23, and we're going to read verse 3. That way, you know the law that was given pertaining to the Ammonites and the Moabites. Let's get that. This is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse 3. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. All right, so now we're going to read that in the English Standard Version. The King James is a little hard for some people. But that is basically saying that an Ammonite or Moabite is not welcome into the congregation of the Lord even after their 10th generation. So let's read another translation so we can get some understanding on that. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter into the assembly of the Lord even to the 10th generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Forever. No Ammonite or Moabite is welcome into the congregation of the Lord forever, which is something that should trigger you with the book of Ruth. Here you have a woman named Ruth who was a Moabite, and she had a husband who was an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. And they both are part of Jesus' genealogy. Okay, so now... We're going to get back on to Achior. So now let's go and let's get Nehemiah 13.1 because I don't like to do the island scriptures. A lot of these people, they do island scriptures all the time. One scripture out there by itself. So let's get that. This is going to be the book of Nehemiah chapter 13 and we're going to start at verse 1. This is the book of Nehemiah, chapter 13, verse 1. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people. And therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Forever. So this right here confirms that the same Bible account that we have of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse 3, was in the same scroll that Nehemiah had. Okay, so now let's keep going into verse 2 so we can see why the Moabite and the Ammonite was not welcome. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. So now we understand. We have a full breakdown that the children of Ammon and the children of Moab was not welcome into the congregation of the Lord forever. But here we have Ruth. No one can explain Ruth, okay? The only thing they do is they'll take you to judges and they'll say, well, in those days we had no kings, so the men did what was right in their own eyes. Well, what about Achior? Okay, what about Achior? Because this is after Judges. Okay, so now let's get a little history on Nehemiah. Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem in 445 before Common Era, B.C., 13 years after Ezra arrived. He returned for a further visit sometime between 433 and 423 B.C. He may have made several journeys between Persian capitals 
and Jerusalem in this period of 20 years. Now we're going to get a little history on the book of Judith. The book of Judith is an imaginative, highly fictionalized romance that entertains as it edifies. From a literary perspective, the book is an artistic masterpiece constructed in two parts. And we have chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to chapter 7, verse 32, and then chapter 8, 1, all the way to chapter 16, verse 25. With each internal order by a threefold chiastic pattern. So they are saying that the book of Judah is a fiction. All right. Now, the Catholic Church. They believe it to be true, okay? Israelite camps, they believe this book to be true, all right? So most people, okay, they believe that the book of Judith is fiction, okay? First off, when you read chapter 1, I won't go fully into it, but it calls Nebuchadnezzar, okay, the second, it calls him the king of Assyria, okay? And that just throws everybody who has knowledge off because we know from the Bible that the Babylonians conquered Assyria. Why would he be king of Assyria, okay? Now, we know that the Bible has a lot of things metaphorically put, so... There's a huge confusion about the book of Judith anyway. But I just want to deal with the scripture violating that's going on in the book of Judith. Now, with all that in mind, we know that a Ammonite or a Moabite cannot come into the congregation of the Lord forever. And doing so, I believe, will be a sin. Okay, according to Nehemiah, because he's seen that there were Ammonites and Moabites in Israel because the chief leaders were chief in the trespass of having Ammonite Moabite wives. So we would consider it a sin. According to the Bible, Deuteronomy 23, 1 through 3 and Nehemiah chapter 13 verse 1. Now we want to get to Judah again. And we want to get Judah chapter 6 verse 2. This is the book of Judah chapter 6 verse 2. And who art thou, Achior, and the hirelings of Ephraim, that thou hast prophesied among us as today, and hast said that we shall not make war with the people of Israel, because their God will defend them. And who is God but Nebuchadnezzar? Okay, so Achior is an Ammonite, and he's being accused of prophesying. All right. Now, I want to go to Judith, chapter 14, verse 10. This is the book of Judith, chapter 14, verse 10. And when Achior has seen all that the God of Israel had done, he believed in God greatly and circumcised the flesh of his foreskin and was joined unto the house of Israel unto this day. So Achior, not only did he believe in God greatly, but he was circumcised and the Bible says he was joined to the house of Israel. Now, what a lot of people don't get out of what we just read is Judah chapter 5, verse 20 through 21. This was his prophecy. Okay, let's get that. This is the book of Judah, chapter 5, verse 20. Now therefore, my Lord and governor, if there be any error in this people, and they sin against their God, let us consider that this shall be their ruin, and let us go up, and we shall overcome them. Okay, so he's saying, look, if these people are sinning, you can defeat them. But if they are not sinning, 
God is going to be with them. So I'm going to let you finish. But if there be no iniquity in their nation, let my Lord now pass by, lest their Lord defend them and their God before them. And we become a reproach before all the world. So he's giving them a prophecy. Now think about it. According to the story, Judah did go inside their camp and she beheaded Hollow Furnace. And the children of Israel had a great victory. But what was the sin? Somebody tell me what was the sin that happened immediately after she cut off Hollow Furnace's head. Achior joined unto the house of Israel. There you go. There you go. According to the Bible. According to the Bible. Y'all knock it off. Y'all knock it off. Step your game up and then y'all can answer next. Audience. Okay. That's right. According to the Bible, a Moabite or an Ammonite ain't supposed to enter into the congregation of the Lord. So how did God help Judith have a victory if she committed a great sin after the victory? Why would he even help her? Okay, that is what can lead people to believe it was a fiction. Okay, now I'm just reading the Bible and I'm just going through it and I'm seeing things that don't line up and you don't hear anybody bringing this out. You don't hear Israelite camps talking about this because this will discredit them. This man was an Ammonite. He prophesied and he was joined to the house of Israel and the Bible says he believed in God greatly. So one could believe that either Deuteronomy chapter 23 was put in there by man and not God, since we have Ruth also joining the house of Israel. OK, but it is a huge confusion to those who study the Bible. Like, what is it? OK, is this book of fiction, the book of Judah? Uh, was Deuteronomy 23 added? Was the Israelites being racist? What's up? Okay. This is what goes through the mind of a person who studies. Okay. So good job, all of y'all. So now we want to keep going back to where we was at. We was talking about your boy Esdras. He was speaking on behalf of Israel. He was standing in the gap. He was praying for his people. Okay, all to no avail, all to no avail. Now I want to go in 2nd Ezra chapter 9, verse 9. This is the book of 2nd Ezra chapter 9, verse 9. Then shall they be in pitiful case, which now have abused my ways. And they that have cast them away despitefully shall dwell in torments. Okay, Israel had the law. Israel had the commandments. Keep going. For such as in their life have received benefits. And have not known me. And they that have loathed my law. Okay, Israel was given the commandments. They was given the law. This is talking about Israel. Was the other nations given the law? No. no. They wasn't. Okay, Israel was given the law. So I want you to read verse 11 again. And they that have loathed my law. While they had yet liberty. And when as yet place of repentance was open unto them, understood not, but despised it. The same must know it after death by pain. Israel has to know it by pain. That's why it says judgment begins with the house of God. Jesus even said, too much given is much required. God required more from Israel. And that's what Ezra didn't get. All he could see was his people being trodden down by the Gentiles and didn't understand that. But he didn't realize that Israel was supposed to be the lighthouse. Israel was supposed to be high above all nations. Israel was supposed to keep the code of law. 
So therefore, now they must know it by pain. It's amazing how when you talk to people in the comments, they don't have any Bible knowledge. For instance, I told one guy, Jesus said the kingdom is going to be taken from Israel. You know what he says? He says, yes, it's true. The other nations is going to rule over us. But when Jesus comes back, we're going to get the kingdom. And I'm like, so what are you talking about? Even while Jesus was there, even before he was there, they always was in captivity. Okay? From Persia. Okay? Greco-Roman. Babylon. Okay? He didn't say, okay, y'all finna go into captivity. He said the kingdom is going to be taken away from you. Okay? So it's one thing to go into captivity. And it's another thing to have the kingdom taken away from you. They have no idea that it was not only speaking of the kingship. They already lost that in Jeremiah chapter 22. But the scepter of the prophethood was going to pass from Judah to Shiloh. Okay? And this is because there's a lot of leaders, so-called leaders, who are not getting online talking about those real heavier matters. They just want to talk about John 3.16. Okay? They just want to talk about Jesus being black. They don't want to talk about who was the kingdom going to, okay? Because you're going to have a whole lot of heat on you trying to make a video talking about the kingdom is going to go to the northern kingdom, okay? Ain't no scholar buying that. Ain't no person that studied buying that. So they don't talk about it. But yet they puppets. They little puppets is all in the comment sections with all the breakdowns. Okay, and they ain't even getting it from the puppet master. All right, so now we want to keep going. Ezra thought the world was made for Israel's sake, but the angel corrects and says the world was made for the righteous sake. Second Ezra chapter 7 verse 11. This is the book of Second Ezra chapter 7 verse 11. Because for their sakes I made the world, and by when Adam transgressed my statutes, then was decreed that now is done. All right. Now we want to go to 2 Ezra 9, 13. Because that was Ezra. He was saying the world was made for Israel's sake. But now let's see what the angel has to say. And therefore being thou not curious of how the ungodly shall be punished, and when... But inquire how the righteous shall be saved, whose the world is, and for whom the world is created. He didn't say Israel. He said the righteous. God is looking for the righteous. That's what he wants. He's exalted them of low degree. He's removed the mighty from their seats. He has resisted the proud. Okay? And he has accepted the lowly. God is not looking for a racial ethnic group. God is looking for good works. He wants good works. Just like Rahab was saved by her good works. That's how you're going to enter into the kingdom of God is through good works. Because to be honest, you don't know what you are. You do not have a list of all your grandfathers. From the time of Israel, for those who claim to be Israelites. In Nehemiah's day, you would have been put from the priesthood. You couldn't come in there and say, oh yeah, I'm black and you know, I'm from the tribe of Levi. I'm from the tribe of Levi. They're going to be like, where are your paperwork? Where is your paperwork? They can't just go by hearsay. You're going to have to show proof. You're going to have to show paperwork. As Ecclesiasticus say, deliver all things in writing. You're going to have to have some writing proving you are an Israelite. Now we're going to go to 2 Ezra 9, 38. And we're going to talk about this woman, okay? Because now Ezra is told to go in the field. 
Right now, he doesn't have to fast. Right now, he can eat the flowers of the field. But now, God is about to show him something. He's going to show him what he's been acting like. Let's get that. Verse 38. And when I spake these things in my heart, I looked back with my eyes, and upon the right side I saw a woman. And, behold, she mourned and wept with a loud voice, and was much grieved in heart. And her clothes were rent, and she had ashes upon her head. Keep going. Then let I of my thoughts go that I was in, and turned me unto her, and said unto her, Wherefore weepest thou? Why art thou so grieved in thy mind? And she said unto me, Sir, let me alone, that I may bewail myself, and add unto my sorrow, for I am sore vexed in my mind, and brought very low. And I said unto her, What aileth thee? Tell me. What's wrong with you? What's the matter? And notice, she said, I am brought very low. Israel was very high, but guess what? Israel has been brought very low. Now let's keep going. She said unto me, I thy servant have been barren, and had no child, though I had an husband thirty years. In those thirty years I did nothing else day and night, and every hour, but make my prayer to the highest. After thirty years God heard me, thine handmaid, looked upon my misery, considered my trouble, and gave me a son, and I was very glad of him. So was my husband also, and all my neighbors, and we gave great honor unto the Almighty. Okay, now thirty years. Okay, this is metaphorically as well. It can go to speaking of Jesus, okay? This is also a type and shadow of Israel, but it also is a type and shadow of the Christian church, okay? Because remember, Jesus departed at age 33. He went into the heavenlies, but many people believe that he died. So keep that in mind with this story. Let's keep going. And I nourished him with great travail. So when he grew up, and came to the time that he should have a wife, I made a feast. And it so came to pass that when my son was entered into his wedding chamber, he fell down and died. He fell down and died, okay? Now think about it. We have lies on biblical record saying that Jesus was crucified, and he was not, okay? But now we're thinking about the nation of Israel, how the nation of Israel lost its power. It's lost its rulership. Now it's on the bottom. Okay, the other nations are trampling all over her. Oh, Israel, let's keep going. Then we all overthrew the lights, and all my neighbors rose up to come for me. So I took my rest unto the second day at night. And it came to pass, when they had all left off to comfort me, to the end I might be quiet. Then rose I up by night, and fled, and came hither into this field, as thou seest. Keep going. And I do not purpose not to return into the city, but here to stay, and neither to eat nor drink, but continually to mourn and to fast until I die. That's exactly how Israel is right now, okay? Israel lost the kingdom, okay? And a lot of people are in denial. They are in denial because you know what? No more racial pride. It's over. And then think about the Christian church. Their whole life is wrapped on Jesus, okay? When they see you, they like, Jesus loves you. Jesus this, Jesus this. They are centered around Jesus. They have no thoughts of his father, okay? All they care about is Jesus. So this story is a picture of Esther's as well. Because remember, Ezra was constantly crying about Israel, about Israel, about Israel, about Israel, all right, that he couldn't even go on with life or embrace others because he was so focused on Israel, just like the Christian is so focused on Jesus. Let's keep going. Then left I the meditations wherein I was and spake to her in anger, saying, Thou foolish woman above all other, seest thou not our mourning? And what happened is to us? Thou hypocrite, Ezra. Look at that. He was doing the same thing about Israel. So now God is showing him what he sounds like. Now keep going. How that Sion, our mother, is full of all heaviness and much humbled, mourning very sore. 
And now, seeing we all mourn and are sad, for we are all in heaviness, art thou grieved for one son? All you focused on is Israel, just one nation, and for the Christians, just one messenger? God has many messengers. We make no difference between them. Okay? God has many creatures. He's not making no difference between them. He did that in the past for Israel, but Israel blew it. Israel blew it. So now let's keep going. For ask the earth, and she shall tell thee that it is she which ought to mourn for the fall of so many that grow upon her. For out of her came all at the first, and out of her shall all others come. And behold, they walk almost all into destruction, and a multitude of them is utterly rooted out. Who then should make more mourning than she, that had lost so great a multitude, and not thou, which are sorry but for one? You are still so focused on one nation. What about all the creation God has made? The Bible says a righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. What would Noah have done, okay, if he had only grabbed just one animal? And left all the other animals to die. Okay, he would have failed. Noah is a picture of the Gentile messenger. He is out to save the world. Jesus was sent to the lost sheep. Okay, so now all these things that he is saying is now coming back to him. Because all he is focused on is Israel. He is not focused on God's chosen. He is not focused on the righteous. Okay? He is focused on a bunch of people that despise God's commandments, brought other gods inside of the temple, killed the prophets. He's not concerned about the righteous. Let's keep going. But if thou sayest unto me, my lamentation is not like the earth, because I have lost the fruit of my womb which I brought forth with pains, and bear with sorrows. But the earth not so, for the multitude present in it, according to the course of the earth, is gone, as it came. Then say I unto thee, like as thou hast brought forth with labor, even so the earth also hath given her fruit, namely, man, ever since the beginning unto him that made her. Keep going. Now therefore keep thy sorrow to thyself, and bear with a good courage, that which hath befallen thee. For if thou shalt acknowledge the determination of God to be just, thou shalt both receive thy son in time, and shalt be commended among women. Go thy way then into the city to thine husband. And she said unto me, That will I not do. I will not go into the city, but here will I die. All right, so I'm going to stay right there. Because that's exactly where our nation is right now. We don't want to deal with the truth of the matter is that God has moved on. God has went to other nations, okay? He tells you in Ezra. He tells you in Genesis. He tells you in Ezekiel. He tells you in Isaiah. He's been telling you through all the prophets, okay? Jesus, okay? He literally came and told us that the kingdom would be taken from Israel and given to another nation after giving us a parable of some wicked vine dressers which were Israel and they refused to bring forth fruit okay what is he going to do to those vine dressers he's going to miserably destroy them and he's going to let out his vineyard to other husbandmen other nations no longer Israel but the amazing thing about the Most High is that he is so merciful and he's allowing them to come in and be a part of it. But you're not running nothing no more, okay? You're not running nothing no more. It's been 2,600 years since we had a king. Israelites and Christians, they have this pie-in-the-sky theory. Everything they talk about is when Jesus returns, he's going to do this. When Jesus returns, when Jesus returns, all their hopes is wrapped up in when Jesus returns that they can't even deal with reality. Jesus said that the kingdom of God would be set up on earth. On earth as it is in heaven. All right, so now 
we gonna be getting in the word, okay? Because I've been saying we gonna get in the scripts, shall we a lot? So we gonna switch it up and we finna get in these scripts. Is that right? That's right. 